Amen. Amen. It's good to be a part of the body here. I appreciate the people and uh, you can come to a church right here, sound Bible preaching and uh, a wonderful worship service. And tonight I'm going to uh, be returning to my study in Isaiah that I've been doing the past few times that the pastor has been letting me preach here. And uh, I'm going to be talking about worship tonight. I'm going to be uh, kind of looking at a couple of extremes. We're going to see one extreme here in Isaiah that we're going to look at, and then there's going to be another extreme that I want to examine that we find real prevalent today in many churches. I'm glad to uh, be a part of a church here that walks a pretty good middle of the line, so I hope nobody takes it personally. Um, why don't you turn to Isaiah chapter 1, and uh, where I, the previous messages have gone through several of these sections here. We're going to pick up in verse 10. So Isaiah chapter 1, beginning reading in verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. And I delight not in the blood of bullocks, or of lambs, or of goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required of this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are trouble unto me, I am weary to bear them. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Here uh, in Isaiah, we have a people that came to God on a daily basis. And yet God says that he pretty much hated every minute of it. Why? I would suggest that it is because the people had lost the ability to discern the things of God. This sinful nation, the seed of evil, evil doers, these rulers of Sodom and people of Gomorrah, they brought to God's altar the very sacrifices which he had required. Not merely the peace offerings, which they themselves kept a share of, but uh, rather the pastor states that they brought the burnt offerings, which were wholly consumed to the honor of God. They didn't bring the torn and lame and sick. Rather, the passage states that they brought fed beasts and the fat of them, the best of the kind. They did not send others to offer sacrifices for them, but came themselves to appear before the Lord. They observed the instituted places. They were not offering sacrifices under every green tree, as we see elsewhere, but here it says rather that they were trampling God's own courts. They came at the instituted times the new moons and Sabbaths and appointed feasts, none of which they admitted. They called uh, some extraordinary assemblies. They called solemn meetings for religious worship, perhaps even some in addition to what God had appointed. Yet, this was even how they did. They applied to God not only with their ceremonial observances, but also with um, their exercise of devotion. They prayed. They prayed often, making many prayers, as the pastor states here. Perhaps thinking that maybe they would be heard because of their excess of speech. They were fervent and important in their prayer as they spread forth their hands as, as men in earnest. But in this passage, Isaiah sums up the problem of the extensive worship substance of the seemingly uh, pious and religious people. If you ask people why they go to church, you'll probably get countless different and complex answers. But here, if you ask Isaiah, you get a simple answer. The passage says here that Isaiah, Isaiah says that Israel went to the temple, in verse 12, to appear before the Lord. They looked no further than to be seen of men, and went no further than that which men see. There are two rhetorical questions here that serve to focus us for the substance um, of the accusations that Isaiah brings against the nation. In verse 11, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices? And in verse 12, who hath required this of you? Both of these questions 
would seem incomprehensible to a people for whom sacrifices were the main aspect of their worship. Isaiah begins with stripping the Jews of their disguises, and though a central feature of Israel when I worship of Yahweh, he doesn't stop with the sacrifices. He continues in the subsequent verses uh, to include nearly every aspect of Israelite worship. He heaps up these, these outrageous terms to describe the uh, extreme repugnancy of their religious observances. The oblations or offerings were vain and foolish. Incense was an abomination. The festivals, feasts, and sacred assemblies were unbearable, sinful, hated, troublesome, uh, wearisome, and a burden. And we can almost imagine the response of the people to, to such an introduction. No doubt they would immediately object and profess their innocence. They had brought the sacrifices and offerings. They had been faithful in coming to the temple. They had prayed. They had observed the religious holy days. These were exactly the things that God had called for. So why then was Isaiah so vehemently preaching against the people about the religious observances? I would suggest that it was because the people had forgotten the spirit of the law, which was designed to promote righteous living and a good, godless relationship with before God. That the heart of the Lord's complaint against his people here is that their religious observances were devoid of substance, reverential fear, and adoration. Instead of an act of worship, the relationship with God had retreated into the background, and rules and regulations and rituals had come to the forefront. Um, the Jews, I think, were greatly mistaken to center their devotion on performing religious observances. They probably felt they performed their duty admirably well, and as such failed to understand the intention and design of God in demanding the sacrifices. It would seem incongruous to them, and perhaps even to us, for the Lord to now say He rejects and abhors the very sacrifices which He had appointed. We ought to uh, observe, I think, that some of the commandments of God are to be obeyed on their own account, while others have a remoter objective in sight. For instance, um, the law enjoins us to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, to love your neighbor as yourself. These things are good in themselves and acceptable to God, and are demanded on their own account. The case is different with ceremonies. Ceremonies are performances which are not demanded on their own account, but for a different reason. Religious ceremonies were not appointed to be a means through which God would be appeased. They were instituted in order that by means of them, the nation might be trained in godliness and might make greater and greater progress in faith and in the pure worship of God. Um, people being true to their nature, as hypocrites, they will ever observe these things with the most scrupulous care, as if that is what religion is all about. They think that they are the most devout of all men, and they have exhausted themselves in, absorb in observing all of these stipulations. And so people might think that they are even more devout. They may even add things of their own making, and contrive uh, new inventions, and abuse the holy ordinance of God by not keeping in view their true objective. Their whole attention is given to the outward and naked performance, and they have no regard for its lawful end. This is the reason, I'd say, why the Lord rejects those ceremonies. Though they had been appointed by His authority, it was because the nation did not consider the object and purpose for which they were enjoined. It was Isaiah's task here to strip away the facade and boldly declare that the Lord is not satisfied with merely outward worship and cannot be appeased by ceremonies. What good are empty religious exercises that do not involve the heart, and there is no change in the life? It's, it's merely play acting and charade designed to keep God happy so that He will not destroy your plans or cancel your prerogatives. It's a pretty low view of God to think that He can be paid off by religious performance. How great is the blindness of men who cannot be convinced that all of their pains they take to worship God are of no advantage unless they flow from integrity of the heart. Uh, let's look for uh, a moment at Psalm 78. Uh, I want to look at verse 37, which suggests to us the, I think, the two supreme aspects of proper worship. But um, I heard Pastor Nielsen say once, he said, text without context. 
text is pretext. So let's look back over this chapter for a moment. Uh, here, uh, the psalmist Asaph records an outline of the early history of Israel. We're in Psalm 78. Psalm 78. Uh, notice the strength of parallel in the opening of this passage, with the opening of the passage we, we read in Isaiah. In Isaiah 1.10, we open with, Hear the word of the Lord, give ear unto the law of our God. And here in Psalm 78, 1, it says, Give ear, O my people, to my law, and find your ears to the words of my mouth. Here in the psalm, we have um, the establishment of the law, and are given the purpose for which it was established. Uh, verses 5 through 7, for he, the Lord, established a testimony in Jacob, and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children. And why should they do this? In verse 7, that they might set their hope in God, and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. But of course, Israel did not set their hope in God, but followed in the footsteps of their fathers. In verse 8 we read, as a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast in God. Now, in this psalm, Asaph is attempting to warn future generations against a repetition of unfaithfulness. But his history seems to always inevitably repeat itself. By the time of Isaiah, Judah is again described as a sinful nation laden with iniquity. Uh, continuing in verse 10, Psalm 78. They kept out the covenant of God and refused to walk in his law and forget his works and his wonders that he showed them. Marvelous things did he do in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt and the field of Zon. Uh, this passage continues on, describing the wonderful things that God had done for his people. Yet they continued to sin and tempt God and did not believe in his wondrous works. Uh, skipping to verse 33. Therefore their days did he consume in vanity, and their years in trouble. When he slew them, then they sought him, and they returned and inquired early after God. And they remembered that God was their rock, and the high God their redeemer. Uh, we don't have time really to get into all this tonight. Uh, but as you continue with this passage, you see this pattern repeated over and over, not only here, but even throughout the whole Bible. God would be faithful to his people, yet they would continually tempt and provoke him. But God, in his astounding grace and his forbearance for us, he would be merciful to them. But as they continue to rebel against him, uh, we can see in verse 67 and 68 of the psalm that God eventually forsook the main tribe of Israel, though not permanently. And he chose Judah instead. Verse 67. Moreover, he refused the tabernacle of Joseph and chose not the tribe of Ephraim, but chose the tribe of Judah, the Mount Zion, which he loved. Uh, incredibly, Despite the immeasurable mercy and grace that God poured out on his people, Judah continued on in the steps of Israel and their fathers. And some 300 years later, we find them in a similar condition as Asaph outlines here, verses 36 to 37. Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth, and they lied unto him with their tongues. For their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. They remembered that God was their rock and redeemer, and they came to worship Him. Yet their worship was hypocritical because their heart was not right and they didn't keep His covenant. The two things that I see here in regard to proper worship of God is that it requires, one, a right heart, and two, observance of the stipulations that have been laid forth. Back to the time of Isaiah, Judah was sure that God would save them from an impending Assyrian invasion because of their religious devotion. And as such, they saw in the sacrifices nothing more than a means to achieve deliverance. This is not what the sacrifices and rituals of these days have been a point of point for. These things were given to them as a means to celebrate their covenant with God. They were to be an expression of gratitude for the deliverance they had already received. And though the people of Judah were overly scrupulous in making sure they remained steadfast in his covenants through the observance of the structure.